So I'm going to say a few words about exploratory data analysis, or in short, EDA. Exploratory data analysis is quite mouthful and typically very underrated, whereas this is a very crucial step when starting any data science project. But why is it so important? The importance of EDA is in the insight it provides in order to know your data, and this is very crucial. Whatever data science project you are starting, data is the first step. So knowing the data and knowing what approach to take on your data is very important. We are going to talk about a lot of the statistical features of the data you're working with here, but, but keep it in mind that it's always important to know different features of your data, sometimes even looking at your data helps you to start the project on a better foot. So what could we understand from uh, the, uh, data analysis, really? First of all, we could get a general sense of data. We could uh, know what distributions our data have. So this is quite important. Is it normally distributed? This is something that we favor, and in many cases, we assume that our data is normally distributed, but this actually is not the case in reality. Of course, if you have a lot of measurements, the hypothesis is that eventually you're going to have a normal distribution, but sometimes your data is not uh, normally distributed as you expect it to be. Data quality is also another problem that uh, you need to be aware of when you are starting your analysis. Is your data complete? Do you have missing data? If you do have missing data, how are you going to address these uh, missingness in your data? Are you going to fill it with the previous value? Are you going to use a regression function? This is very important also when you are starting your analysis. Sometimes the data is so sparse that if you don't do anything about it, you won't get the desired output of your uh, project that uh, you had in mind. Uh, next thing is also, which is also important is the outliers. Uh, basically, it is when we are measuring something and we expect everything to behave more or less the same way to represent something. And there are a few measurements that are not really in line with the expectation of the data. And you could see it sometimes when you're visually looking at the data. And the standard approach is just to exclude the outliers here. For example, in this figure, this is quite an icon. It's not really representing anything. But you have these uh, few circles next to each other, and this one is supposed to be outlier. And typically, we just remove this from the data set and we continue with our uh, data analysis or uh, training the model. Also, correlation between data values is very important. Uh, sometimes your analysis require that your data be your data features be independent of each other. So if you have a correlation matrix like this, you can already see uh, what are the values that are correlated? You could probably choose only one of them if there is a high correlation between different features and go only if for one representative feature in your project and your analysis. And sometimes just by looking at your data, you could see that there are some interesting subsets somewhere. And then you could either focus your analysis on that, or I mean, think about the clustering thing. You, you see a cluster somewhere and you see this cluster is behaving in the way that you are interested in. So you could only focus your attention on that cluster for doing analysis. And also it could be a functional relationship. Is there any function that defines a relationship between different features? Could you just see the nature of the function by looking at the data visualization that you have? So you see already, just by visualizing the data, you could understand many things about your data. And this is important because it could decide what methodology you're going to use on your data when you're going to do the analysis. What algorithm are you using? Uh, what kind of, I don't know, machine learning approach is going to be? what kind of functions you're going to use, what type of uh, data manipulation you need to 
go for. So these are all important things that you could have, you could understand just by looking at the data that you have. So so this already shows that how EDA is important. I'm I'm saying EDA from now on, not exploratory data analysis, because as I said, it's quite mouthful, and it could be a tongue twister. So EDA is very useful and it is an important step when you are starting a data science project. Uh, by data visualization, you could already get a feel of what you're going to have. Of course, this baking representation probably is not everything, but only by looking at them. For example, you could see some of them have cocoa in them, some of them don't have cocoa in them. Data visualization is something like that. So by, by look, you, could you get a sense of your data. Of course, you need to validate this sense later, but at, it puts you potentially on the right path to exploration. So what are the goals of EDA? As I said, the goal is to get a general sense of the data, and you could be doing that by looking at the means of the data values that you have. If you have numerics, continuous uh, numbers, real numbers, you could, uh, you could have a look at the means. You could have, the, have a look at the medians. You could have a look at the quantiles. And you could also get an understanding but by plotting your data. Uh, histograms, box plots are some of the uh, approaches that you could have and and you should always look at all variables that you have so it's not really that uh, you just have a look at the whole data i mean you get some information but you're looking at as a whole but you should go individually to each column is each if each column is representing a variable uh, what is it that it is representing is there missing values do you understand anything but just looking at a column for example, if it's an age column, you could also already understand that who are the uh, data elements, data participants, if it's a questioner, who is the target audience that you had when you were asking the questions. And the good thing about this uh, is that ADA is model free. You don't necessarily need to build a model first to understand your data. It is quite data driven. So that is, that is a plus factor about EDA. And another thing about EDA is that it helps you think interactively and visualize the thing. And remember, human beings are by nature visual beings. As this figure is saying, 80% of us do uh, what we do based on what we see and what we learn by seeing. So the lasting impact that a picture could have, as, have on us is much more than, I mean, saying few words listening to someone, taking notes, reading a book. This is how we are built, so we need to respect this element of humans. Uh, so let's visualize and let's understand the visualization. We continue with the uh, other EDA, go EDA goals, and another one is basically uh, we could use the EDA for uh, understand for the data mining steps of our project. So this uh, exploratory data analysis is very useful when we are using uh, when we are focusing on the data mining. We are not yet in the or we probably never get there to the phase of training the model, building a model, a predictive model. Data mining could be enough to get what we want depending on the question we ask. You remember, as I said in the previous lectures, that the data science is really this feedback cycle between the questions and the data. And sometimes data mining is enough to answer the questions that you had. And uh, so, so that, that is one of the, another important goals that it could provide for you. So let's, let's go a bit in more detail. So what is it that we could do with this EDA or exploratory data analysis. We could have a look at the means. Means basically is the average value uh, in a numerical data set that we're provided. I, I'm sure that you have seen it in high school, you just sum everything up and you, you divide it by the number of uh, elements and then you get an average. And you could also get median. Median is basically that you sort your numerical values from small to uh, large, and then you put a line in between, and that would be your median. Basically, it means what is the value that is sitting in the middle of your sorted data that is called median. 
We could also uh, have a look at the quartiles of sorted. So median is basically, as I said, we look at the data that is sitting in the middle of your data, but quartiles could be uh, what is the first 20% of the data, or what is sitting in the first 20 25% of data, 20% of the data, or what is sitting in the last 25% of your data. That is another important thing. We could also look and figure out the variance by looking at our statistical summary. And what is the variance? Basically, for example, in this figure that you see here, the mean is the same, but as you see, the data distribution is totally different. And that is because the variance. For the red ones, everything is more or less sitting close to each other. But uh, with the blue ones, it is quite, uh, quite, uh, quite distributed. So it, it has a, a longer range. And this is where we could also have a look at uh, standard deviations. This is what a standard deviation is telling us, that how far from average the whole data is sitting. We could also look at the skewness. Basically, uh, by looking at this, it tells us that whether it's normally distributed or it is skewed to the left or it is skewed to the right. Uh, and uh, we either call it negatively skewed or positively skewed. So these are the things that we could get from our statistical summary. And this is al already a good insight. Uh, think about. Uh, looking at the marketing data only by looking at the mean, median, variance, you could uh, of the amount of money that people have spent, you could see where uh, the most money is spent, how much you could expect to get out of your marketing uh, campaign. So this this is already a good insight, but this is not the only thing. We have other ways of understanding the data better. So, uh, as I said, this was the non-visualized way of looking at your data, but we could also have a look at the visualized way of doing this. For example, if we have focused only on single variable visualization, histograms, and this is what you see here is an example of histograms, it, it's, a quite, it's quite a good tool. It could give you uh, very useful information. Uh, in a histogram, you could understand where the center is. You can see how uh, uh, variance, uh, how varied your data is. You could see the variance. You could see the skewness. You could see modality, basically, what is the most important feature of your data. You could also detect the outliers. Like, I mean, in this figure, more or less everything is sitting in between, and the others are not really there you could also see the strange patterns and remember that this uh, bin width and where you're positioning them is very important is in visual visualization if you remember the last time when i was showing you an example of matplotlib uh, the first histogram that i drew for you every bar was sitting on top of each other and that was basically because i had chosen the position wrong so when you're visualizing things you need to be careful of these small things that make the visualization clear and it gives the message that you're interested in better. Histograms are very nice, but there are certain issues with them that you need to be careful when you're choosing them as your visualization tool. For example, if you are dealing with a small data set, the histogram could be misleading at by saying that, it means that a small changes in data could change the bins or the anchor, and that that could be deceiving. So be careful. Probably histogram is not always an ideal choice when you are dealing with a, a small data set. For large, large data set, histograms could be quite effective. And it could be illustrating the general properties of the distribution, as you said in the previous figure. I mean, immediately you can say by looking at the histogram whether your data is normally uh, distributed or not. And another issue, I mean, it's not necessarily an issue, but this is something that you need to keep in mind when you decide to go for histogram. Histograms are effective when we have only one variable uh, at a time. So. If you have multiple, uh, many variables, probably you need to look at different ways of visualizing your, your data. But uh, 
this doesn't mean that uh, we couldn't really get too much information only by looking at one variable. For example, box plots are very good representatives where, where, when we are looking only on one variable. And you could understand so many things here. You could, you could see the range, you can see where the median is, you could also immediately identify different quartiles, and you can even see if your data is, is skewed or not. So box plots are very useful. It's, they are quite compact, but in their compactness, they represent so many things. So if you are only focusing on one, one variable, probably box plots are not a bad choice to go for. So um, by now we have seen histograms and box, but both of them are useful when we are focusing only on one single variable. Well, of course, they have some issues, but this, this is natural with any other method that you're choosing. Nothing is perfect. You just need to understand what tool is best suited for your specific need for your specific data set. And this is very important. This is a skill that comes with experience. and. Uh, you need to do, do, you try different things uh, on the same data set and see which one makes you more satisfied, more happy. Uh, Overplotting is an issue that can happen with box plots. It's also difficult to say the distributional shapes. You really don't say that much of a shape. And uh, there is not really a standard implementation in software. I mean, there are some options for whiskers outliers, but, but generally there is not much that you can play with when you're working with box plots. But I personally like them. They could be quite insightful. So uh, see how, look, at the, your, look at your data and see if it is something that you want to use. Uh, famous time series beta, we have some temporal value and basically we uh, plot the value against the time. So, uh, and you, you have seen that many different places. These, these are one of the quiet standards way of plotting things. You put your time normally on the x-axis and the values on the y-axis, and then you see how your data is going to uh, develop over time. So this, this is something that you need to keep in your mind. If your data has a temporal component, be sure yet to exploit it because uh, it, it, it could be quite meaningful. It could give you quite. Uh, it could give you insight. I mean, for example, if you forgetting about the time component, get an average of the data, the output you get could be misleading because when something is happening, for example, uh, think about. Uh, I don't know a value that you are measuring, and it is summing up all the time. If you are you average over over that basically uh, you really forget about the fact that the data naturally should be less at the beginning uh, comparing to the end because it has been piled. I mean, uh, for example, it's about the amount of water that uh, rain water that has been accumulated over a period of time. The average doesn't really mean much if you don't have this temporal element included in your analysis. We also have a special data. The other one is about time. This is about the space. And uh, this is uh, the, the US election result in different states. And you see, by looking at a simple picture, you can get so much information. You could get uh, the number of states. You can get, uh, by using the colors, who won where, basically, which party won which state, what was the electoral vote in each uh, one. These are all important things. And uh, this one actually doesn't have the flip the states, but in some of them, when the vote that was traditionally, for example, I don't know, for Republicans changed to Democrats, they just use some strips showing that it is a flip uh, a state. So uh, what I want to say about this is that take advantage of the representation of the data when you can in this way, especially data uh, when there is a geographic component to it could be represented quite well using a map, for example. OK, when we have, uh, by, by now, we only discussed about having one single variable. But what if we have two continuous variables? 
like we have here. Uh, it's about uh, the amount of money spent in a restaurant by customers and the number of total bill against the no number of total tip. And uh, a scatter plot is an obvious choice, of course, when we are dealing with two continuous variables. And we could already see a trend here. The bill goes up, the tip goes up. There are some of the outliers we have in these two places, so probably depending on what sort of analysis really you want to do. But uh, these are the outliers, as I see here, and probably they are not that much of an interest. They could be interesting only if you want to understand why they are outliers and you have some extra data attached to them somewhere and you could go back and have a look at that. So the scatter plot could give you quite valuable information when you're dealing with two continuous variables and you want to get an understanding just at, by looking at them and having a single plot. But that doesn't mean that it is always meaningful. I mean, look at this plot. We can't get any apparent relationship between x value and y value. So sometimes only just having a scatter plot representing as our data is not necessarily meaningful. Sometimes we could find relationship between them. We have x and y and very easily you can see that you can pass a line between them and we have a line representing the data. Of course they are not sitting on the line exactly but they're close enough that we say this line is going to represent my data. Basically this is a regression problem. So we could have a linear relationship. Uh, well I mean this is not always the case. The linear relationship is an easy way to go, but it is not necessarily that natural. We could have quadratic. Basically, it is y and uh, x to the power of something. This is how they are related to each other. This is already a step forward. It's a bit more, more complicated relationship. Uh, sometimes we really don't get much variable information. As you say, it is so dense that we need to think of something else. We don't understand much. Basically, the bottom part is so dense that we don't get much out of the data. What if we have two variables and one of them is categorical? Here, I am showing you an example of a box plot. And side-by-side -side box plots are very effective in showing differences in a quantitative variable across factor level. For example, you can see here, for example, the first one is for fail, male, females, it shows how they, they, they differ the outcome of whatever uh, a study that we had or how it is different between different days. Uh, it is, it, uh, I forgot to say it's about tipping basically, at least the first two is about tipping. So here basically you could see men tip better apparently, not by far, but a bit. And people are happier to tip over the weekends. Well, not the weekends, really, over on Sunday. They want to share the good mood, probably. So as you see, you could, uh, when you have one category goal and one continuous variable, you could use side-by-side -side, uh, box plots. Another way is having a stacked bar choice. And there are also good representations when we are dealing with, uh, again, one categorical data and one continuous value. But what we have so many, if we have so many of them, we have continuous values, we have categorical data, but several of them. So it's not only the matter of one or two, it's multivariate data analysis. We could plot something like that as, uh, and you're going to see in the hands-on practice a uh, simpler example of that uh, per plot, you're going to see that. And then you're going to interpret them. Of course, at the end, basically, you're going to interpret block by block, but then it's the whole compact representation of the whole data that you have. And uh, it, it simplifies the things for you. You could also have a, a conditional plot also known as a co-plot or subs, uh, subset plot. It's a plot of two variables uh, conditional on the value of the third variable. That is why it's called conditioning uh, variable. And this is uh, the strength of the conditioning uh, plot. It's also useful 
for displaying scatter plots for groups in the data. And you can see uh, an example here. What you need to have in mind is that what I showed you here are basically a few examples of how you could visualize your data, how you could get information out of your data and understand your data better. As I said, how to get a better sense of your data. The important thing is that you shouldn't be afraid of being creative. Come up with different ways of showing or representing or visualizing your data. The important thing when it comes to visualizing your data, exploratory data analysis, is to send your message across either to the person who you want to explain things to him or her, but also for you to understand your data better. So, so get creative. Uh, take the basis, basic things that I told you here, and of course you can have a look online and read books and journal papers and, and, and learn new ways. But uh, know the basics, try to come up with new ways of doing it. Well, probably you can already do that when it comes to your mini project this week. And uh, exploit it as much as you can. It is a very important and useful step and it's going to help you create a stronger project. If you understand your data better, if you represent your data better, if you find the missing uh, values, outliers, the anomaly in your data, wherever it is. So, this was for this video. In the next videos, I'm going to explain a bit about the existing visualization tools, uh, libraries in Python, and I'm also going to show you a small hands-on practice. And finally, I'm going to introduce this week's mini project. See you in next videos and good luck.